Chapter 15, Boarding School in Shenzhen. At Hangzhou Airport, there were huge crowds milling around, pushing and shoving like a human tidal wave, fighting for tickets. To my amazement, fewer than 10 passengers boarded our plane from Shanghai to Tianjin. I sat immediately behind Father and Yang, next to an empty seat. I didn't know it then, but the China I had always known was changing before my very eyes. My grandparents, Ye Ye and Ne Ne, were both born during the Qing Dynasty, which ruled China for 374 years until Sun Yat-sen toppled it in 1911. Following Sun's revolution, local warlords divided the country into fiefdoms and waged war with one another until the emergence of the Nationalist Party under Chiang Kai-shek. When Japan invaded in 1937, most of China was controlled by Chiang. However, the communists under Mao Zedong were gaining momentum. Between 1937 and 1945, the nationalists and communists formed a united front to fight the Japanese. After Japan's surrender in 1945, the civil war resumed between Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek for the control of China. By September 1948, when Father and Yang took me north to Tianjin from Shanghai to separate me from my aunt, the communists were already in control of Manchuria and were advancing rapidly southward towards Beijing and Tianjin. Province after province was being lost to the victorious People's Liberation Army. Most people were fleeing in the opposite direction. Railroad stations, airports, and dockyards were jammed with passengers wishing to escape to Taiwan and Hong Kong. Being completely ignorant of the political situation, I merely thought it rather strange that the plane was so empty when the airport was so full. As soon as we took off, the stewardess came around to hand out landing cards. Are you traveling alone, she asked. No, I'm with my parents. Good, she smiled. Then they'll have to fill this out for you. The airplane began to toss and roll. I felt sick to my stomach, closed my eyes, and must have fallen asleep. When I awoke, Father was sitting by my side, gently shaking my shoulder. I sat bolt upright. Sorry, Father, I began. Have we arrived? Not yet. He had three landing cards in his hand and a sheepish expression on his face. The stewardess asked me to fill out these cards. I'm afraid I've forgotten your Chinese name. Is it Jun Qing? A ping went through me. I meant so little to him. I was such a nobody that he didn't even remember my name. No, Father, that's little sister's name. Mine is Jun Ling. Of course, Jun Ling. He gave an embarrassed chuckle and quickly scribbled Jun Ling on the card. Now give me your date of birth. I'm afraid I don't know, Father. It was true. In our family, the stepchildren's birthdays were unknown. We counted for so little that our birthdays were never remembered, let alone celebrated. He scratched his head. Hmm, let's see now. How old are you? I'm ten, Father. Ten years old. How time flies. He looked into space and was lost in reverie. After a while, he continued, But we have to complete these landing cards. Tell you what, why don't I give you my birthday? Would you like that? Yes, please, Father. How wonderful to share the same birthday as my father. I was thrilled. Now you know what to say next time when someone asks you for your birthday. That's how November 30 became my birthday, the same day as my father's. Yang's brother, Pierre Prospery met us at the airport. I had met him once before when he came to our house for dinner in Shanghai. I didn't know where I was or what time it was, but dared not ask. The day seemed to be drawing to a close. Say good evening to your Uncle Pierre, Nyang instructed me. When I did, she exclaimed, not in the Shanghai dialect, no one speaks that here. It was true, everyone in the crowded airport was shouting to each other in Mandarin, the local dialect of Tianjin. Outside, it was already dark. I knew I was far from home, where Aunt Baba was probably having dinner with Ye Ye and my three brothers. Was she thinking of me, too? Father and Yang hurried me into a big black motor car. Father sat in front, talking business with Uncle Pierre and the chauffeur. Yang and I were alone in the back seat. I smelled her perfume and was dizzy with worry and nausea. I closed my eyes and pretended to be asleep because I was afraid. We drove for a long time. When we arrived, it was pitch black. The chauffeur got my suitcase out of the trunk while Nyang told me to stand with her in front of the massive gates of a large building. It looked familiar. Where had I seen it before? The gate swung open as soon as Nyang pressed the bell. Two tall foreign nuns in starched white habits were standing at the door. They shook Nyang's hand and patted me on the head. We have been waiting for you, they said. 
Bow to Mother Marie and Mother Natalie, Yang instructed, and I bowed obediently. Sorry we are so late, Yang exclaimed as the chauffeur took my suitcase inside. Behave yourself and listen to the sisters. Suddenly I realized she was speaking to me. More than that, I was being dismissed. Mother Marie used to be my English teacher and Mother Natalie my French teacher when I studied here. She turned to the sisters with a charming smile. I won't trouble you now, but will telephone you at a more civilized hour tomorrow. Sleep well. She strode back towards the car with the chauffeur trailing behind. He respectfully opened the car door for her, started the engine, and pulled away. All this time, Father and Uncle Pierre had remained in the car, talking to each other in hushed, earnest voices. Neither of them bothered to look up or wave goodbye. I watched the taillights of Father's car disappear, and an awful loneliness sank in. They had tossed me aside like a piece of garbage. The sisters spoke in English, which I barely understood. When I answered in Mandarin, they shook their heads. No, no, no Chinese. You must speak only English or French here. This is how you learn. They took me into a big room with rows and rows of beds, each with a curtain at its side. Only the three beds nearest the door had their curtains drawn. Mother Natalie placed a finger against her lips for silence. She pointed to the bed next to the three occupied ones and closed the curtain softly. This is where you'll sleep with the other three boarders here. We used to have so many, and now there are only four counting you. Tomorrow, you'll meet them all. Come with me now, and I'll show you the bathroom. It's late, and you must be tired. Where am I, Mother Natalie? I asked. Am I in Chenjian? She stared at me in astonishment. Didn't your mother tell you? Yes, you're in Chenjian, and she has enrolled you as a boarder at St. Joseph's, where she herself went to school. She telephoned us two days ago and told us you had attended kindergarten here as a day girl when you were five years old. Don't you remember? I lay awake for a long time, snuggled under the blankets, thinking, no wonder those iron gates look familiar. So I'm back at St. Joseph's. Well, at least I'm not in an orphanage. Things could be worse. Through a slit in my curtain, I could see the shapes of the rows of the empty beds in the semi-darkness bed after bed with no child sleeping, each with its curtain primly pulled back, waiting and waiting, everyone bare and sorrowful, just like me. I must have dozed off because I woke to the murmur of voices. Sunlight poured through my curtain and I recalled with a start I was in a strange place far from home. I crawled out of bed and nervously peered through my curtain. A girl my age was sitting on the bed next to mine, talking to a grown-up woman. They smiled at me. Hello, the girl said in English. Did you sleep well? Yes, I answered, adding hastily in Mandarin. My English is bad. In fact, I hardly speak any. She switched at once to Chinese and said, I am Nancy Chen. This is my mother. Mother Natalie says you flew in from Shanghai yesterday. Is that true? I nodded. Nancy turned triumphantly to her mother. See, didn't I tell you? I can hardly believe this, Mrs. Chen exclaimed. Aren't you afraid? No, I replied with a laugh. Afraid of what? Didn't your parents tell you the communists don't believe in God and hate foreigners? A Chinese student in a foreign convent school is seen by them as a member of the same religious order and we were persecuted along with the nuns if they win the war. I could only stare at her dumbly as she continued. What are your parents thinking of? Everyone is fleeing Chanjin for Shanghai or Hong Kong. And here you are coming from the opposite direction. Do your parents plan to move to Chanjin and live here from now on? I don't think so. I heard Father say to my uncle in the car yesterday that they're flying back to Shanghai in four days. She looked at me horror-stricken. And they are leaving you here by yourself? All alone in a foreign convent school? Don't they read the newspapers in Shanghai? Haven't they heard the communists are winning the war? Soon PLA students will be marching in from Manchuria. When they arrive, they'll probably arrest us capitalists along with the foreign sisters and put everybody in prison. Thousands of refugees from up north are pouring to Tianjin every day to get away from them. It's almost impossible to get a plane or train ticket out of here. We've been waiting for two months. Suddenly I remembered the chaos at the airport the day before and could only suck in my breath, sick with dismay. Then she said, what have you done that your parents should wish to punish you like this? My new school seemed so different from my old school in Shanghai. To begin with, there were fewer than a hundred pupils in this enormous place meant for a thousand. We were divided into six classes depending not on age, but on our ability to speak English. To my embarrassment, they placed me in the beginners group. My classmates ranged from five to eight years old, while I was almost eleven. It was as if I'd never left kindergarten. 
Instead of algebra, I was doing addition and subtraction. We were not supposed to converse in Chinese with each other at any time, so I said nothing at all unless the sisters addressed me by name. My classmates probably thought I was dumb because I was so much bigger, but never raised my hand or volunteered to answer any questions. In English conversation class one day, Mother Marie pointed to me to stand up and read aloud from Grimm's book of fairy tales. My mouth was dry and I knew my accent was terrible. Mother Mary mimicked my pronunciation and everyone snickered. Finally, she asked, how old are you? 10. How do you feel about coming to school here? I looked around at my classmates, all of them smaller, younger, smarter, and fluent in English. I feel old, I told her. You mean like having one foot in the grave? All the girls chuckled. I looked up the words grave with a fury of concentration in the English Chinese half of my dictionary. Then I made a quick search for two other words in the Chinese English section. Well, as I was saying, do you feel as if you have one foot in the grave? Yes, and my other foot is on a piece of watermelon rind. There was loud laughter and a twinkle came into Mother Marie's eyes. So we have a comedian here. Tell me, what is your favorite book? I held up my dictionary. This book here, I can't live without it. Everyone laughed, including Mother Marie. And if you could have one wish granted, what would that be? To receive a letter addressed to me, just one letter, from anyone. Nancy Chen left Tianjin with her mother in the middle of November 1948. By then, the number of students had dwindled and we were all gathered into a single classroom, ranging in age from seven to 18. Every morning, fewer girls would show up than the day before. One by one they vanished, many without saying goodbye. By the middle of December, I was the only student left. Three days before Christmas, Mother Marie gave me an assignment. I was to learn by heart a poem called A Visit from St. Nicholas. I didn't like the poem. It was too hard. I looked up all the complicated English words and translated them into Chinese, but the poem still didn't thrill me. When I recited it, Mother Marie asked, who wrote it? Someone called Clement Clark Moore. Really? I wouldn't have guessed in a million years. Clement Clark Moore is probably turning over in his grave. It sounds like nothing I've heard before. I thought you were repeating a Chinese poem. I didn't feel so bad because she smiled while saying this and patted me on the head. Besides, we were all by ourselves in the classroom and there was no other students there to laugh at me. Mother Marie was nice, but she seemed at a loss as to how and what to teach me. In fact, all the sisters appeared somewhat bewildered and avoided looking at me directly whenever they happened to meet me in the corridors. They themselves darted around aimlessly all day in their black and white winter habits, silently clicking their rosaries. The atmosphere was eerie and strange. Our days were numbered. The communists were coming. Everyone knew, but nobody talked about it. Day after day, I would wander by myself from classroom to classroom because there was nowhere to go and no one to play with. I hated being by myself and missed my schoolmates terribly. All the rooms were empty, rows and rows of desks and chairs, and nobody anywhere. I would look at the whitewashed walls hung with maps of China, Tianjin, and France, stand in front of the blank blackboard filled with chalk dust, stare at the crucifix above the door, sit at a desk scarred by thousands of cuts and pencil marks. The place had become a ghost town. Once I wandered into the chapel after lunch and found it full of praying nuns. Apparently, this was where the sisters were spending most of their time. I knelt in a pew and looked at the majestic vaulted ceiling. The statues of Jesus and the Virgin Mary radiated a special tranquility as they peered out from the candle smoke and incense vapor floating upward. I dared not breathe too hard for fear it would all be blown away. Someone started playing the organ. The music enchanted me. For a few minutes, I felt safe again the way I used to on Sunday nights in Shanghai when I would snuggle deliciously in bed for hours and hours, knowing there was no school the next day. Once more, I saw Ye Ye and Aunt Baba playing cards by my bedside. Everything was cozy, relaxed, and comfortable. My aunt's hair was combed back smoothly into a bun that glistened in the lamplight. I heard again the rhythm of her voice intermingled with Ye Ye's laughter drifting across the room. What wonderful soothing sounds. Then she tucked the blankets around me and lowered the mosquito nets over my bed. On Christmas Day, I ate dinner all by myself in the vast refectory. Sister Helene brought me an enormous plate of ham, beans, and potatoes. Meanwhile, she was rushing in and out distractedly, bringing in one thing at a time, bread, water, butter, applesauce, salt, pepper. But she had neglected to give me a fork, and I had nothing to eat with. 
One minute, she seemed glad I was still around for her to fuss over. The next minute, she had forgotten all about me after saying she would bring me hot Christmas pudding for dessert. I sat for ages, pushing my food around on my plate. Outside, I could hear the sound of a phonograph scratching out the sweet refrain of Silent Night, sung by an unknown soprano. I put my head against my folded arms on the refectory table and fell asleep. Later on that evening, I wrote to Aunt Baba. Dearest Aunt Baba, I've been trying to think of what I should say to you because I don't want to worry you, but there is no other students in the school now except for me. I am the only one left, just me and the sisters in this enormous place. Sometimes I can't help wondering what's going to happen when the communists come. Will they take me away with the sisters and put me in a prison too? It is impossible to describe to you how I feel. I have written to you so many, many times, and to Yeye, and Third Brother, too. So far, there is no letter from anyone. Why don't you write? Why doesn't anyone send me a letter? I want you to drop me a line when you get this. I can't imagine why you don't reply. You have no idea what it's like. To be all alone here makes me very, very sad. At night, I lie awake for a long time and stare at all the other empty beds in my dormitory, laid out next to each other like little tombs. I want you to send me your photograph so I can place it by my bed. I would give anything in the world to be with you and Ye Ye again, back in Shanghai. Don't forget me. Day after dreary day went by. New Year's came and went. It was 1949. There was nobody to play with and nothing to do. The sisters were far too busy to fuss with me. Every day was a free day. I spent a lot of time in the library reading fairy tales. Mother Marie had given me a book for Christmas called Paper Magic, Playing Solitary Games with Paper, Origami, and Paper Cuts. Hour after hour, I learned how to fold and cut paper into airplanes, ships, flowers, monkeys, and birds. I loved this book because my troubles seemed to vanish when I applied its magic. I didn't dare ask Mother Marie too often whether I had any mail because the answer was always no. I didn't know then that Nyang had instructed the nuns to stop all my incoming and outgoing mail and forward it to her instead. Look, there is no point in inquiring any more, Mother Marie told me one day. Believe me, if you get a letter, I'll shout it from the rooftop and bring it to you at once. Even if you're asleep, I'll wake you up. Then she looked embarrassed and gave me a piece of candy she took from a small golden box in her pocket. This little snuff box is the only thing I have to remind me of my father. She told me he died in Nims three years ago. So you see, we all suffer in one way or another. Let us pray for each other. In her voice... I heard sadness and fear. I was bouncing a ball against the wall in the schoolyard, sending it as high up as I could and jumping up to catch it. I saw Mother Marie huffing and puffing towards me. She was waving her right arm and yelling, Adeline, Adeline. The French nuns in St. Joseph's School called me Adeline, not Yen Jun Ling. Was it lunchtime already? I glanced at her as I bounced the ball hard one last time. Back up it went. I tried to catch it as it came down, but it landed on my head. It hurt a lot. But I didn't want Mother Marie to notice, so I acted as if it was nothing. What was she saying? Adeline, your aunt is here to take you out of school. She is sailing to Hong Kong next week and wants to take you with her. My heart gave a giant lurch as her words sank in. For a dazzling moment, I knew with every fiber of my being that somehow, against all odds, Aunt Baba had come to my rescue. The whole of me was vibrating with joy, and I ran as fast as I could towards the visitor's lounge, followed by Mother Marie. I stopped abruptly at the threshold. In front of me was a small, mousy foreign woman with dark brown hair, dressed in a western suit. There was no one else. Adeline, she smiled and greeted me in English. How big you've grown. Do you remember me? I am your Aunt Rain Schilling, your Nyang's older sister. I smiled back shyly, saying nothing. A black wave of disappointment swept over me. Come here. Don't be afraid. The last time we met, you were still in kindergarten. It must have been six years ago when your Nene was still alive. You were only four or five years old then. No wonder you don't remember. Something came over me. Great waves of anguish swelled up. I tried again and again to greet her, to be polite and say how grateful I was that she had come. Words choked me as I struggled, silently cursing my poor English. Then, to my great embarrassment, in front of Mother Marie and the stranger, I started to weep. I hardly knew why I was crying. For the last few months, I had taken the blows as they came with stoic fortitude. The pain of being torn from my aunt, the anxiety of seeing all my schoolmates disappear from St. Joseph's, the perception of being abandoned and forgotten, the fear of being imprisoned by the communists, the knowledge of my teacher's own terror and helplessness. 
Of course, I had no words to describe any of this. Somehow, it was still desperately important to put up a front and keep up the pretense. Besides, Aunt Rain was stroking my hair and telling me not to cry. Hush now, hush. Everything will be all right. It's a good thing your parents mentioned you were enrolled as a boarder at St. Joseph's when they dined with us in September. Otherwise, how would we have known? To think we might have left Tianjin without you. Now you can sail with us to Hong Kong next week. You can share a cabin with me and my daughter, Claudine. She is nine. My husband, Jean, will share one with our son, Victor, who is ten. Your parents will be so pleased to see you. They fled to Hong Kong three months ago with Ye Ye and your younger brother and sister. For the first time since my arrival in Tianjin, the sisters allowed me to go out. We walked briskly towards Father's house on Shangdong Road. Outside, it was sunny and cold. The streets were deserted. There was very little traffic and few pedestrians. A truckload of soldiers in peak caps and padded winter uniforms drove past us. People's Liberation Army, Aunt Rain exclaimed. How young they are. None of these communist soldiers look over 20. I was shocked. Is Tianjin in communist hands? I asked in a whisper. Has Chiang Kai-shek lost the war? Yes, with hardly a bullet being fired. Beijing is lost too. The nationalists simply gave up and retreated south. Didn't the teachers tell you? No, they never talk about the Civil War. But all the girls are gone, and I am the only pupil left. Thank you for rescuing me. It's a good thing I suddenly thought of you. You see, we've been living in your father's house for the last few months and taking care of it for him. Since we're leaving, I tried to contact your big sister to keep an eye on the house. That's when I learned she and her husband have already escaped to Taiwan. Didn't your sister visit you to say goodbye before she left Tianjin? I've seen no one since I came here last September. You are my first and only visitor. Aren't you afraid all by yourself like this? I heard the concern in her voice and was close to tears again. A little. She tried to reassure me. Everything will be fine from now on. Where is Aunt Baba? Is she in Hong Kong too? No, she chose to remain in Shanghai. Does Nyang know you're taking me with you to Hong Kong? No, I haven't had a chance to write her. I was terrified and trembled with fear. May I please go to Shanghai instead of Hong Kong, I begged. No, of course not. The communists will probably be marching into Shanghai in a few months. Don't look so scared. You'll be safe in less than three weeks. After lunch, we'll come back in a rickshaw and get your belongings. What can be better than being with your parents and Ye Ye in their new home in Hong Kong? I dared not reply, but thought, what can be worse? All the time, I was quaking at the thought of what Nyang would say when she saw me.